I'm Phoebe. I'm going to be chairing the plenary panel, peer review and feminist practice. Um, but first, a few things. So welcome to the first part of feminist publishing in the digital age. Um, we have a lot more sessions tomorrow that are sort of run by graduate students, so I hope you'll join us for those. Um, and I want to thank our sponsors, firstly, which are the College of Arts and Sciences, the Graduate School, um, AAA, the English Department, the Center for the Study of Women and Society, and the Library. Um, and also thank you to Chelsea, who's right over there, um, who is an organizing force, seriously. Um, she deserves every ounce of that and more. Um, but so I want to sort of just introduce the panelists, and then I'm going to turn it over to them. They're going to give sort of 10 minute talk, each of them, and then have a chance to respond to each other's presentations. And then we'll open it up for questions and discussion after that. Um, so we're going to start with Carol Stabile and then Radhika Gajala and then Kim Sachuk. So I'll, I will introduce you guys in that order. Um, Carol Stabile is the Director for the Study of Women in Society, a professor of English, or in English, the School of Journalism and Communication um, and the Department of Women's and Gender Studies here at the University of Oregon. Carol received her PhD in English from Brown University where she did research on gender technology and feminist theory. Her inter interdisciplinary research interests focus on gender, race, class, and sexual orientation in media and popular culture. She is the author of Feminism and the Technological Fix, editor of Turning the Century, Essays in Media and Cultural Studies, co-editor of Primetime Animations, Television Animation in American Culture, and author of White Victims, Black Villains, Gender, Race, and Crime News in the U.S. Culture. She is currently finishing one project in Old Media, um, a book on women writers and the broadcast eh, sorry broadcast blacklist in the 1950s entitled Black and White and Red All Over, Women Writers and the Television Blacklist. And she is also conducting ethnographic research for a project that looks at gender swapping practices in massively multiplayer online games. Also, she is one of the founders of the University of Oregon Digital Scholars and a founding member of FEMBOT, an online collaboration of scholars conducting research on gender, new media, and technology. That's Carol over there. <laughs> Okay, Radhika Gajala, um, who's right there also, <laughs> um, uh, got her PhD at the University of Pittsburgh. She's a professor of media and communication at Bowling Green State University and the director of the American Culture Studies Program. Her book, Cyber Selves, Feminist Ethnographies of South Asian Women, was published in 2004. She has co-edited collections on South Asian techno spaces, wedding, oh, sorry, Webbing f Cyber Feminist Practice, Global Media, Culture, and Identity, and Cyber Feminism 2.0. And her latest book, Weavings of the Real and Virtual Cyber Culture and the Subaltern, is expected to be in press in early 2012. That's exciting. She is currently continuing work on projects examining microfinance online, nonprofits, and crafted networks online, um, and offline, and money in virtual worlds and social media, in which um, each of these looks at aspects of ITization and NGOization of global socioeconomic work and play environments, and the other coding and placement of affect and labor in digital diasporas. She's also working on an edited collection on digital diasporas and globalization. So that's radical. <laughs> and lastly, but by no means least, is Kim Sachuk. Um, Kim uh, got her PhD at York University and she is a professor of communication studies at Concordia University in Montreal. She is the former editor of the Canadian Journal of Communication, the current co-editor of WE, Journal of Mobile Media and, Mobile Media, and a co-founder of Studio XX, a Montreal-based feminist digital media center that brings together artists, community activists, and academics. Her book publications, all co-edited, include so, Sample the Wireless Spectrum, Used Slash Goods, oh, I cannot pronounce that, Verko Perugin, 
My journey is terrible, too. That. <laughs> that. <laughs> S- slash embodiment. Um, wild science, reading feminism, medicine, and the media, and when pain strikes. She is presently completing a collaboration with medical illustrators at the University of Toronto on the processes of visual communication in the history of Western biomedicine. Her most recent research explores the pitfalls and potentials of ubiquitous mobile computing in two areas. The research creation-based project, Virtual Daylighting, Buried Rivers, and Augmented Reality for Mobile Devices, explores the politics and history of urban waterways in Montreal. As part of an active aging mobile technologies research network and in collaboration with a local library, Kim is also developing a set of pilot projects that will recycle lab talks and engages older adults, particularly those living in residencies in digital media production. She has also, to date, supervised over 15 PhDs and 45 MAs as the sole supervisor, um, the majority of these projects dealing in feminist subject matter or subjects from a feminist perspective. And I also want to welcome Kim and Radhika to Eugene at this point. Now. So, welcome. Um, so, without fur- further ado, Kara. I'm going to take over. Um, just thank you to uh, Chelsea Bullock and Grace Peak and Phoebe Bronstein, who did the organizational work for today's event. And welcome also to Jackie Wallace and Mel Hogan, who are joining us from Concordia, too. Um, they're graduate students at Concordia. Okay, I, you know, I'm, I, I wanted to start by talking about um, my own kind of blind, blind spot in this area as a media scholar, because I think it's taken me a long time to get to a place um, where I've become really critical of academic publishing practices, because I think for so many of us, they're so naturalized. They're so much a part of how we were trained to think of ourselves as scholars. Um, but it does strike me as, as a point of contradiction that for a generation of feminist scholars who are trained to be critics of media, right? I grew up in a Western theme park in Northwestern New Jersey. So I, I come by my critique of the society, the spectacle, um, honestly, and from a, from a very early age, right? This kind of predisposition to be critical of the narratives that were being sold to us to amuse and entertain us. Um, Then I went on to get my PhD in an English department where critiques of the canon were becoming popular um, and people were finally starting to talk about feminist research and feminist literature. We were getting to this place where I love this example. You know, instead of seeing Emily Dickinson as, you know, a a sort of crazy eccentric who lived in the attic, it was like crazy like a fox, right? Mm -hmm. If you were a woman and you wanted to write at that point in time, you couldn't have devised a better strategy for doing it, right? Mm -hmm. You didn't have to get married. You didn't have to have a bunch of kids and die at a young age. Um, So it was this moment where we were starting to rethink the very basis for literary production. Um, And for me, books have always been another form of media, right? Um, I think that explains my move. So then we come to this moment, right? And it's it's the moment in which we start looking at, at media that's marketed to women. Right? And start saying, well, look, you know, instead of seeing this, these as the dev- devalued products of mass culture, we need to look at the ways in which women are interpreting them, women are using them, women are engaging with them. Um, and this is another moment in that process of critique. Um, then we come to a more contemporary moment where, um, <laughs> you know, it's about a kind of female agency, right? It's not about making do with the products of mass culture. It's about kicking ass, right? It's about saying, look, you know, we want to produce images of women that aren't going to be these passive images um, that, <laughs> of women who require protection and so on and so forth. But through this whole period, right? And again, this is about the particularities of my own, my own position, right? My own race, class. Um, my weird kind of educational trajectory, and it it was kind of weird and idiosyncratic. But through this whole process, we never really thought or had robust conversations about the kind of work we were being asked to do as part of our job, right? We never thought, um, for example, about our own production practices. Um, Where were we publishing our work? Who owned the corporations that were publishing our work? And I say this... You know, I say this shamefacedly as someone who's never been in a Walmart because mostly I've lived in places where I've had other options. But it wouldn't occur to me to shop at a Walmart or to support Walmart in any way. Yet, 
here I am publishing in Taylor and Francis, and I'll go on to talk a little bit about their holdings in journals that are very expensive, that are very inaccessible. Um, and we also, I think, accepted a model that reproduced existing hierarchical models, the peer review of distribution of editorial practices, um, also really problematic labor practices. I'll go on to talk about this in a minute, but think about the fact that, think about all the profits that journal publishers make um, that are based on exploiting our own labor. We don't get paid for peer review. We don't get paid to submit, you know, for the articles that we're producing. We don't get paid, in most cases, for editing. And a significant amount of copy editing, if you publish with Rutledge right now, we were talking about this at lunch, um, you're really expected to do your own copy editing these days, right? You copy edit, you have to produce your own index. You also have to, pr have to really market your own book. Right? Because if you aren't constantly staying on top of your publisher, there's no guarantee that your book is going to continue to be shopped at conferences and conventions, that it's going to be included in the catalog after that first burst of publicity. Um, there's also the question of access that I don't think we really thought about that much either. Who could read? Who could get our articles? Who could see them? I mean, subscribers to feminist media studies, subscribers to Camera Obscura, but think about how much access to those journals cost. We didn't really think about that, I think. Um, and we also reified the divide between academic and non-academic feminist communities. Um, I don't think, I think that the kind of pressures of academic publishing really prevented us from th thinking about that question enough, right? One of the lessons for me of a lot of the fan discourse around media these days is that there are people who are out there who are really interested in these ideas, right? Mm -hmm. They have amateur communities of criticism um, that are robust, that are smart, that are vibrant, that are wonderful. Um, but in the past, we've been prevented from connecting with them for, for all different kinds of reasons. Um, and it also divorced the professional and the political. There was the work that we put in those old silos you know, who said that journals or articles, or journals are places where articles go to die, or where scholarship <laughs> goes to die? Um, so, here's the feminist politics part. Again, the Walmart example, right? I wouldn't shop at Walmart. Um, I haven't shopped at Target since the boycott started. But yet, I publish in, um, in Taylor and Francis. I've published in Taylor and Francis journals routinely, um, and they're owned by Informa. I urge you to read, Ted Stripus has a great article on cultural studies and the politics of publishing where he talks a lot about um, the kind of organizational culture and structure at both Informa and Sage. Um, but as you can see with Taylor and Francis, don't you love the, the events and training, the Adam Smith conferences, which are pretty much what you think that they would be. <laughs> um, and there's also the fact that a lot of their professional and commercial information is, um, is aimed at, at militaries throughout the world, right? These are things that I think we don't think about um, when we place our articles here. There's also the fact that um, the cost of access to these journals, and this is from last year, you'll see the institutional costs for journal subscriptions. Um, online isn't cheaper, isn't that much cheaper, right? than the old print version. Um, the other thing that I found that was really interesting is that um, if you want to purchase a PDF of an article from a, in a Taylor and Francis journal, um, it costs you $35 to download it, right? I can buy you know, music on iTunes, right? And it's gonna co cost you a buck 99, but if you wanna read an article I published 20 years ago in Critical Studies and Media Communication, it's $34. likely to get it if, they, if it was free. So um, this got me thinking over the last five to 10 years, and I know that, that Julius here in Jump Cut's been doing this for some time and has been on the cutting edge of this change. Um, but there, there are lots of fissures right now, I think, that are ripe for exploitation. Gramsci said that the thing about a crisis in hegemony is that it also opens up these moments of possibility. Right? The old peer review system in the humanities and the social sciences is starting to break down. Um, traditional journals are having more and more trouble getting people to review for them. 
Um, I'm on a, an editorial board, the Western Journal of Communication, where they've just changed the model. They no longer ask people to be on the editorial board. The only way you can be on the editorial board is if you've done any work, right? So if you haven't reviewed for their journal in the last year, you're taken off the editorial board. So there's a lot of acknowledgement that these old models of, of really exploited labor are changing. Two minutes, okay, excellent. I'm almost there. Um, there's also the fact that really, what do we get from publishing in these journals? I know that people are gonna argue we get cultural capital, right? And that might be true if you're publishing a monograph on the university press. Um, but what else do we get for that, right? They reap all the benefits of publishing that work and we get very little. I think some people would say that, you know, because of the crisis in academic publishing, fewer and fewer monographs are gonna be published anyway. So it's a moment in time where promotion and tenure committees are starting to have to rethink who's going to evaluate the content of the dossiers that they're getting. So even that old, you know, and when we were, um, we were in Australia this summer talking to the editors of Fiber Culture, and what they told us about starting Fiber Culture is that they had to sort of perform legitimacy Right, which is a phrase that really struck us because what they said is that it was hard when they first started, but the quality of what they were publishing, right, and the process whereby that quality was ensured really started persuading people very quickly that the journal was legitimate. And so I think that this, this is a moment in which we can start to do that kind of work. People are doing it in different ways and in, 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 in an isolated fashion, but I think it's a great time for us to start thinking about how to move forward. There's also the fact that, and maybe people like Karen can speak to this later, is that journals are now 65% of library budgets. Um, I know the English department here, they're just talking about, um, about uh, getting rid of the print copies of a lot of the journals, right? You can talk about it more in the Q&A. Um, but this is also a moment in which it's going to be really difficult to sustain those budgets and to have access to those kinds of journals. Um, and I think I'm out of time, so I can come back in the Q&A, and I'm sure that, that, that Radhika and, and Kim will pick up on some of my other notes about feminist interventions and seizing the means of production. So thank you, Radhika. And thank you for inviting me um, and all the work you guys did before we came. Uh, um, I'm going to be talking slightly differently from Carol. Um, I um, speak as someone who has been reviewing, writing, and negotiating the structure, which all of us have been, so, but that's the point of entry I'm talking about. I've, I've put some points out there so we can, um, the idea is to rethink the notion of labor, of efficiencies, of the literacies required. What is collaboration? And even the notion of time and how we switch it around if we are talking about feminist review, reviewing and publishing and writing. Um, the question of legitimacy, how do we reframe it? How do we uh, reframe the issues of assessment and accountability, and this comes from my conversation with Kim this morning, um, versus feminist accountabilities. Um, and what does it mean to talk about open access labor? Um, and then we have all these discussions these days about affective labor and immaterial labor. Um, there's a reason I have a little hyphen between immaterial because immaterial sometimes in daily discourse just reproduces the notion that the, the kind of female labor we do is not material. But, uh, and then uh, I've the preference for talk, thinking about precarious labor. And finally, what I would consider a lot of my work to have been is guerrilla editing and publishing and include. And then, you know, moving to include myself and trying to include. Um, so, um, so in that sense, I, I wanted to throw those terms out and quickly um, do kind of a, uh, recap of my experience in relation to this and reflection. Um, I came to writing um, 
uh, when I was uh, 16 years old and uh, one of my siblings picked up something I'd written for class and they said, oh, I think that's what you might be good at. People had a difficult time figuring out what I might be doing. <laughs> so I said, oh, you can actually put a sentence together and you can imagine a story. Yeah, that might be something you'd be good at. Why don't you strive to be a writer? So you know, silly me, I took that seriously. <laughs> um, so, but the interesting thing about that is since it, my struggle with sending stuff out started then. So I would send stuff out to journals, magazines, over and over again, get back, you know, comments. Um, and then I enlisted in, 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 in the correspondence course about writing journalism because I didn't go to, um, I finished my undergraduate education and stuff, but parallelly I wanted to learn to write. So I learned to write, and then I continued to send stuff out, con continued to get feedback, <laughs> rejections. So I learned the art of receiving rejections very early in life. Um, so when, when I came to academic writing, um, after a series of uh, publishing in, you know, what, what, female magazines, you know, not necessarily fashion tips, but, you know, mini romance stories, and, and on the other hand, some kind of, fa you know, poetry. I came to graduate school, and and um, I was sitting in on um, MFA class um, and trying to write a book report, um, and this was before I was admitted to the communication program at Pitt, where Carol eventually came to teach. Um, and since I didn't know how to work with the structure, me who considered English my language because that's the only language I can read in writing, I did the report and I got, the, I got comments back. And the comments said, you write like somebody who does not know, is not a native speaker of this language. I was like, whoa. <laughs> um, what else language then do I write in? Because this was the only language I can read and re write, really. I can speak other languages, but I can't read and write. So that was my first moment of trying to actually understanding that I um, uh, was an outsider in different ways. So I promptly kind of buried the dream of becoming a fiction writer in the Western world, uh, where anyway I was in that and became aware of the politics of becoming a native informant as a fiction writer. <laughs> and went to a practical journalism school and then ended up in rhetoric and communication. Um, so, so doing all these tasks, and, and as I was doing my dissertation, came the internet, right? So it felt like I was writing and screenfuls of things would come at me and it felt really great. But in terms of trying to negotiate the issues I wanted to write about, um, when you do your dissertation with a committee that actually understands what you're doing about, and I was lucky enough to have some of that, uh, you get it done. But then after that become, comes the struggle with academic publishing. Who's going to get it out there? And if you don't get it out there, will you get promotion and tenure? And tenure is really important, right? If the bottom line is you get to keep a job. <laughs> so, um, uh, the process of my struggle then continued in terms of laboring to try to structure my articles to fit all those series of um, institutional structures that, uh, um, you know, that were just pointed out, Carol was pointing out too. So I started to work towards that and I learned to um, try to negotiate how to put in the issues that I need to put in. Now, as somebody who works at the intersection of um, various kinds of intersections, not just gender, but and, and in terms of um, uh, but, uh, and class, and uh, it's also in terms of context, of different contexts outside of anything anyone in, in mainstream, mainstream academia might really be able to understand. So what happens when you write something from, let's say, uh, rural, um, uh, rural Africa, or rural India, or rural even uh, Bowling Green, is you need, to, <laughs> you need to translate it and you need to explain it so that the person sitting maybe in some structure of a tall building somewhere actually can understand it. And in that process of translation, something gets lost. So uh, 
So thinking in terms of all the stuff, which it's okay, it's fine. Um, and the thinking of the, in terms of all the stuff I listed, my issue was, is the timer? Oh, okay, that's fine. Don't worry about it. It's just, it's just a slide. Yeah. Oh, right. That's fine. Thanks. Um, so thinking in terms of all that stuff of translation, I became aware of, um, I somehow stumbled through uh, uh, publication and tenure, uh, but I became aware that I could do something um, as a reviewer and as somebody who could go maybe visit all the publishers and say, okay, I have a project, we need to, tr I, uh, maybe I could edit collections and, um, and try to get out special issues of collections and themes. And, um, and so that's what I call guerrilla editing, publishing and trying for inclusion. But the difficulty of mainstreaming when you, even when you try to include is that you're still, you still have to train the other person to give up a lot of what they're trying to say by disciplining their language and their structure. And you have to kind of tell them it, the same things that you heard people tell you. Um, so when you're reviewing, you're doing, you kind of look for those. And a lot of this labor, I think, is performed, interestingly enough, by a lot of female reviewers because we've been through it. Um, my, I have a lot of mixed feelings about this. Am I just feeding, I'm, uh, yes, tenure is a good thing. Am I just feeding uh, everybody, every kind of difference, every kind of way of expression, and every kind of research finding um, that has significance back into a monolith? And that's kind of where I ca um, I'm going to stop. So what does it then mean to, for us to be feminist publishers? And what opportunities might this digital age give us when we're still talking about a cultural and um, a material, um, um, you know, overall structure that we we can individually perhaps break through and enter and move up in, and are we making an impact? I'm not trying to be depressing, but I'm saying how do we make the impact? So thank you. just work automatically, please. <laughs> nope. Um, what do we need to press? Theoretically, Theoretically it should. Very promising. It's very promising. Okay, then it's okay. Somebody wants coffee. Right? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's still some up there. Yeah. Oh, it's in this one. It's showing up. It's showing up here as if it's like doing that. Can I check? They're already mirrored. Well, 
first, I'd like to thank Carol for uh, bringing uh, myself and Radhika and Jackie and Mel here, and also to Phoebe and Chelsea for the incredible organizing, and for all the people who've been picking us up and driving us around, including Bryce today and Mary yesterday. It's been really great to have um, uh, to hang out with you, basically. So um, I'm just going to start this, and I guess I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this is a talk that I thought I should write out a little bit because I didn't want to go too much off track, but it's kind of called Give Me That Thing. And this is my grand, this is my grandmother over here, and that's me, young feminist. <laughs> you can tell that I was going to be trouble early on, so. <laughs> and that's my great grandmother, and that's my mother. And my grandmothers um, did not, uh, were not literate people. Uh, they didn't have a chance to go to school. And they always said, the best thing you can do, Kim, is you need to get an education because you don't want to be stuck in the dungeon days. So I thought that was great advice. But at a certain point, I also wanted to uh, do some oral history with my grandmother before she died. She was quite ill and old at the time. And I had a video camera, and I started asking her questions uh, about her life. And in the middle of it, she kind of looked at me, and she said, give me that thing. I want to ask you questions. And she was in her, she was about 83 at the time. And uh, so she started asking me about my life. I was in my 20s. I hadn't had much of a life by then. But it really was great because she really turned the camera back on me and made me feel extremely uncomfortable. But I also thought, way to go, Grandma. I'm so proud of you. You know, you just took it and thought, I don't need to wait for anybody to teach me this. I can do this. So I think we need to celebrate media takeovers. And I'm, I'm delighted to be here because I've met fantastic people like, um, well, Carol again and uh, Alicia again and all of you soon, I hope but also Gabriella and um, the wonderful work that she's been doing. And so um, with women in Oaxaca and on issues around media and revolution, which I think uh, are themes that strike close to my heart. Uh, I just think we need to think about takeovers and not just makeovers. And I'm here to connect with you. And this is a, from a colleague of mine who's not here, but I'm hoping that if we do do things together, you'll have a chance to, we'll have a chance to meet each other. And Liz does a lot of work with refugee kids and is thinking about really innovative ways to disseminate the kind of work that she's doing, uh, including, uh, in some ways, self-publishing uh, and publishing their work that she does in collaboration with them. So I'm here to connect with you and to dream. Uh, this was one of my early dreams, Studio XX, that uh, I helped, I co-founded with some other people. Mel's been very implicated in it as well, which is a feminist media bilingual studio that's now celebrating 15 years of activism in Montreal. I wasn't sure I wanted to be an academic, and so it was really important to me when I got my first tenure-track job, which I couldn't believe I actually got, to um, make sure that I was also involved in um, things outside of academia. I want to talk. I want to listen. I want to scheme with you about what we want as feminists, as writers, as publishers, and I've been a publisher as an editor, didn't make any money off of it. Oh, that wasn't the point though. As activists, as artists, as media producers, and even as academics. About what we want for our collective future adventures. ADA, which uh, the subtitle, what is it again, Carol? Ada, Ada Love, Love, yeah. Ada Lovelace, yeah, it's in the journal, it's a gen journal of gender, meaning, and autonomy. Thank you. And I want to be mindful, as we do, of the systems and structures that are around us. And this is a web, uh, and the kind of changes in that are happening around social media and Web 2.0 for activism in forms of storytelling and narration that surround us and the kinds of value systems that both Carol and Radka were talking about but I think underlie and may undermine us. So do we still believe in adages that we're told early on in our careers, like publish or perish? Do we commit to open access, for example, which my university is pushing? And I have to say, I think because they see us as being funded by public money, and if we're funded by public money, then we also should have a responsibility as academics to make our work available to those publics, and we don't even know who they are. What assemblage of digital tools, what assemblage of skills might we use or develop? What do we need, desire? And what new genres will we invent? This was something that was always interesting to me when I worked at the Canadian Journal of Communications for six years, was how limited and unimaginative we were in thinking of even what an article is. 
how long it has to be, the formulaic ways we're taught to write uh, articles. Um, so one of the things that was so easy to do was just to say, listen, we have four different things that we publish other than just articles. We publish works in progress that we called, uh, um, that were kind of review essays. We published reports where we could invite people who were non-academics to contribute. We had published um, not just review essays, and we published media reviews. We even published uh, a film that had been part of, uh, uh, done by a former student of mine, Maureen Bradley, called Rethinking the Montreal Massacre, that was basically a media analysis of the murders at the Polytechnique. And uh, the feminist distribution, video distribution company uh, uh, in Vancouver that were distributing it went out of business, so Maureen had contacted me, and it's available through the journal. And she wrote a, an epilogue, I think, about 10 years after she'd made the video, of course, for the journal, in which she discussed, discussed her own relationship and reflected on what she'd made 10 years earlier. So what will we invent? And what old genres can we appropriate? Can we transform? What feminist approaches do we co-create? And I don't always know what a feminist approach means. And I think it's something to be discussed about we, what we mean by it. And again, Radhika's talk hinted at that because there's so much pressure, especially for, I think the assumption is sometimes if you're a woman scholar, that you will be more nurturing. <laughs> <laughs> How would they look? Aesthetics, Jackie will talk about aesthetics and Mel's also very much interested in design. Sound, because they can be multimodal. And how do we incorporate this? And what kinds of peer review do we then need to be able to deal with this? How do we send it out? How will it feel? So if we say yes, and I'm assuming we're Connie here because we are saying yes, <laughs> what do we do? And how? How do we do it? Because process, as a feminist, I would say issues of process are absolutely fundamental. It's not only what you will create, kind of instrumental, it's how you set up these processes of co-creation. Mindful, as we move together, of what material conditions, to refer back to Radhika, affect our lives and our so-called immaterial labors, because there's so much work that is invisible. And that's what I learned also editing a journal, was how much uh, the peer review system is fantastic if it's done well, but how much time people could spend on an article. And sometimes I just wanted to tell them, you are doing too much, actually. Please do less. Let the authors do the work. Give them some guidance. But do not they're not your graduate students. They're your colleagues. And what does it mean to change those relations to each other? Hmm, Invi material, immaterial or invisible. What are the differences in our locations and our access to resources? the risks that we might take and the potentials of feminism, I think, to move us and others to make these kinds of changes in our academic lives and to think through the question of what publication means in this context. How do we be mindful of the commitment, the labor, the time it takes, these are all from discussions with Radhika this morning, to collaborate, collaborate meaningfully, I think. Not to mention, <laughs> whoops, the fatigue that comes. So it should be the fatigue that comes from our desires to give. And I would talk uh, maybe in the discussion about what I call assessor fatigue, which I'm completely suffering from now because of the over scrutinization, I think, of the kind of work we do now within these environments. So um, where we're constantly being called both to apply because everything's a competitive process but we were always being asked as well to evaluate and assess each other. I can only say that uh, by the time next week rolls around, I'll have been on eight exam committees, written I don't know how many letters of reference, and this is all part of my job. I love doing it, it's what I can give back, but, and, three, and three reviews for different journals, and I feel it's my responsibility to. But I do know that these things take their toll and take time, and so I, my question is, how do we not work more efficiently, but how do we work together to maybe not um, suffer from burnout, but also to say, if I'm you know, asking a new generation of feminist scholars to join this lovely life, then I want to make sure you have a good life doing it. So thank you for inviting me, and that's all I have to say for now.
I still want them. You know, when we have conversations like this, there's there's so much to say that I never know quite where to begin. But there were two things I really wanted to talk a little bit more about. Um, and you'll keep time on me, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh yeah, sure. I could move. Is it on? No. Okay, you got me. Um, and, and the one speaks to something that you both touched on, which is the existing hierarchical review system, um, which I've, I think we've all experienced it. I have never experienced it as being particularly helpful or productive or something that's really helped me kind of improve my research or move it along. I mean, mostly it tells me how to make it my, my essay conform mm -hmm. to the model yeah. that's – on offer, but it certainly doesn't encourage creativity, and I thought that that was a point that you made, Kim, that's really important, that we do have an opportunity to think about presenting our scholarship in different forms and not necessarily, you know, the 25-page um, journal article that is inaccessible and that's often really boring for us to read, right? I'm always reminded, you know, when I read people's non-academic writing of just how interesting my students are or my colleagues, and then when you take it and you kind of, you kind of have to force it into that, that sort of formula, um, I, think, I think that it's, you know, it's, it's such a loss of creativity and talent. The other thing I've been thinking a lot about is beta reading and fan communities, and I have to thank Mara Williams for, for helping me start thinking about this. Um, because when in fan fiction, um, there is, you know, the, the practice of, of having communities of beta readers is really kind of central um, to revising work, to making work better. And it's really interesting to get on and read about what the rules for engagement, how you do it, um, what the responsibility of a beta reader is to the author, what the author's responsibility is to the beta reader. And it actually kind of codifies this relationship that I think we all take for granted. And so one of the things that we're thinking about with the online journal project is how do we create a community and um, – uh, a, a sort of review system that's going to let us harness some of that, that's going to let us really work with our th authors to improve their work, that's really going to let us share some of the excitement that you don't get to share in the old-fashioned kind of blind review process. And frankly, you know, the other thing that we're really sort of challenging is, is the whole notion of blind review, which, I mean, for those of us who've reviewed – is sometimes, you know, very much a fiction, especially in smaller interpretive communities where everyone knows everybody else. I also think there's something to be said for people being accountable. Um, one of the things I've learned from trolling <laughs> is that when people are anonymous, they don't necessarily have to be generous. But if a reviewer knows who you are, you're accountable in a way that you aren't if you're anonymous, A. And B, for interdisciplinary work, I think it's vital that you know the discipline of your reviewer because often it gives you a way of understanding and processing that information that you might not have otherwise. The other thing I, was, I wanted to mention was this notion, and, and I hear it all the time, I know we all work hard, okay? But we are really the privileged, you know, a very, very privileged sort of sec segment of workers. And I think as feminists, we spend a lot of time now talking about how to say no to things, and we forget at the same time that there are things you need to say yes to. There are things you need to say yes to, and sometimes they're risky, right? And the reason that we're sitting here is that an earlier generation of feminists took those risks, right? They didn't say, well, I'm not going to do this because I might not get tenure. You know, they didn't say, well, I'm not going to do that because my book's not going to get published. They didn't spend all their time promoting their books and their professional work. They said, you know, this is a risk worth taking, right? And we're not going to, I mean, I think for, for more senior people, it's, it's really vital that we take the lead on that um, and that we provide leadership because what we're looking at is this neoliberal model, you know, that's being imposed on the university that says, no, you should not, you should be focused on producing the book. You should be focused on producing the article. There's no labor that you should be performing outside that, even if it's labor that you love and that you find meaningful and that makes you accountable to a community of feminists. Because I think if we forget that stuff, then we might as well just give up on feminist politics in the academy because it really, in a lot of ways, it's become nothing more than another form of professionalization. So that's, I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, uh, obviously, there's It was Shakespeare Quarterly. Shakespeare yeah. Quarterly. Oh, so this is our argument this time. No, 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 no. It's a great example. I'm glad you raised it. But I, I would sort of, the, the example I know more about is Kathleen Fitzpatrick's yes. planned obsolescence, where she's crowdsourcing peer review of the book. Mm-hmm. Um, but Karen, can you speak to, to what Shakespeare Quarterly is up to? Yeah, it's been a while since I read the exact study. But basically what they were trying to do was do all of this crowdsourcing still trying to produce the journal article as the canonical Shakespeare Quarterly article. So it was an experiment in the review process alone. And one of the things that's intriguing about what Kathleen Fitzpatrick is doing and some of the stuff we've been talking about is trying to integrate that review process more into the actual article and the piece and what really that process helps make the piece final and how you kind of show all that together. So that's just kind of one example. But the Shakespeare Quarterly thing was a pilot, and I think they just got more money to do something else. So it will be interesting to see where they go from there. Was it open to anyone to, or was it subscribers of Shakespeare Quarterly it could comment? Subscribers or that kind of community, I think, association. It wasn't fully public. Mm-hmm. That's at least that's my understanding. Yeah. And and that leads me in, in, uh, uh, to actually raise the issue of when we're talking about um, digital publishing, sometimes uh, we're, we, may, uh, we may also be uh, caught up in following a trend where, uh, without actually, which, which is actually not that different from uh, women doing the reviewing work and then training you to be writing for the same structure, which we're all guilty of. I mean, I'm not saying that that's a, but when we're also equally guilty of sometimes going to the next trend. And uh, the buzzword now is crowdsourcing. And um, mm-hmm. and so we have, we, well, it's, it, I, that's why I like the way Kathleen is doing it. I certainly like the way she's doing it and she's putting in so much work into it. But I'd be intrigued, interested to see how she negotiates the publishers when it, Finally, you know, it but she she has a contract with NYU. For yeah. those of you who want to look it up, it's planned obsolescence. Yeah. Kathleen Fitzpatrick, um, and so she has a deal with NYU Press, and they're letting her do the crowdsourcing, and then she'll incorporate that level of peer review and publish it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not actually that risky a business because That's she already right. has a contract with with. And then she has a team yeah. That was your, f- did you have a second question too? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Sorry, I'm not sure I fully understand. Are you saying then that the peer review that you've seen more recently has more transparency built into it? Has the structure, I mean, obviously, you know, um, mm -hmm. the peer review system which came about in the early 20th century, as far as my memory serves me, um, put in place to institute a certain professionalization, mm -hmm. right? And make way for uh, a more, you know, whatever, X plus plus term of the alternative, uh, plural system these days, you know, mm -hmm. German in, in, in origin. Now, it's not only the appeal of work that have, um, uh, that have more recently instituted the peer review system. It works rather well for them in its exactly sort of um, destabilizing that, that existing system of taxation. But it's terrible for women, among other things, mm -hmm. right? So they like peer review because it seems more professional, whatever. So I'm always struck by these, these different rhythms at which the world is in its rhythm. Mm -hmm. um, that's all. So <laughs> mm -hmm. you yeah. know, where, um, I was at a conference last December where everybody in the room was celebrating how the three blind peer review finally enabled them to get their work published as opposed to the old boys mm -hmm. on hips. Mm -hmm. Very surprising. Mm -hmm. So you're asking them to talk back now. I don't yeah, I don't think anybody's asking yeah. them to toss it, yeah. though. Yeah. 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 But I don't want to hurt you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to cause you pain. Yeah. Can, I, can I give that? That just returning to certain open sources would be very frightening in these situations mm. because they have five years. I, I do think what I know what you're talking about is, is, is that when it was a closed system, it was the old boys network who was doing it, and it worked out for particular kinds of even... Um, uh, less empowered people uh, uh, to get access when 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 uh, when you go out into the global, so to speak, and this is also what we see with activism that comes on the internet, and the contradictions, right? The the contradictions that have written been written about social movements on the internet. Then when they become global, they get access to particular kinds of power structures, and they get treated. Uh, they get to use that power structure back at the local power structure in a particular way, and and it, and and then there's an opening up of of a particular um, uh, subjectivity that gets empowered, a group that gets empowered. With it. So so it works to a certain extent for the Zapatistas um, and and for some others who can negotiate this in a very uh, savvy manner. However, it doesn't work in other contexts when, when you're talking about an absolute um, invisible subaltern in, in a different way without the required literacy. So what you're saying is point well taken in that you're talking, we're all talking about certain groups of people. We're all people with certain level of uh, privilege, as Carol's pointed out, and certain level of privileges. And if we go international, this is also what we hear in relation to the neoliberal arg um, argument of access when some, some points are made um, about privatization. And uh, in conferences, I have somebody sometimes uh, either from um, a African context or an Indian context or somewhere that, where they say, well, it, 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 sometimes privatization has enabled certain groups of people from these other contexts to come back into the main, into the center. So this is a center periphery argument that's going to be fluctuating and creating other issues and moving around. Um, and, 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 and it is as problematic as the other issues that well, we're talking about. But I, I would add that part of what, well, there are two things that, that come to mind. Is one thing, one obstacle we've encountered in talking about this is that women does not equal feminist, mm -hmm. right? And so part of what we're talking about is, is our colleagues in Australia discuss it as, you know, peer review is a feminist political practice. And I think in that sense, um, it's something that needs to be theorized more carefully, but I don't think that the old kind of values of objectivity and peer review have the same purchase when you think about the peer review process in that way, right? I mean, because for, for I mean, part of the, 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 the answer to the question and the problem is to say there's still going to be a process Right, and it's the process that's going to need a lot of scrutiny and careful thought, so that it doesn't become what did Joe Freeman call it—the tyranny of structurelessness, 
um, which has always been a problem in feminist movement. So I think you have to have a process. And what we're saying is that if you want to have a feminist process, um, it is going to look different than <coughs> the old system of objective kind of um, depoliticized peer review. But More women get mm -hmm. their work published, right? Mm -hmm. For me, that is a feminist issue, whether those women are feminists or not. Um, so it's just something I think that kind of struck me as to what extent to be a part of this conversation. I think peer review, I mean, this is as a journal editor, I have to tell you, I was totally just in awe of the people who, when they accepted to do peer review, how careful they were. I had this kind of image that mm -hmm. peer review would be terrible and that it was this horrible kind of you know, trial that people would subject their work to. And I have to say the majority of reviewers that I, would, uh, that I ended up soliciting, um, I felt were, um, were really trying to, in some ways, bring out the best in the article they had mm -hmm. before them. And uh, I think as an editor as well, it, is, it was my job as well to assess the peer reviews right. and to provide guidance to the authors based on the peer review and also help the, um, the authors to be able to then contextualize or understand that process. And a lot of them actually did find, even I got from people I ended up rejecting, letters of thank you because, um, as we said, we never really rejected, we only declined. Um, but they said, I have, you have given me feedback. And you're right, this, I'm not ready to publish this, but I want to sit on this work, and will you reconsider it? So I think, again, even within an old journal, relatively old, 20 years or so, that um, I think that the peer review system is not something I would want to necessarily throw out. But I think it, I, can, I, I also know that it, it can be abusive to people. Mm -hmm. It can be a way of the editor not taking also certain kinds of responsibilities about things they're going to put into place anyway. And mm -hmm. it's the lack of transparency about these processes that I think are, is very troubling. So, I mean, I, I really, you know, I think peer review is not a terrible thing. It really is how it's done that's so vitally important. Chelsea, uh, well, I just wanted to say, actually, you're not saying two different things. Mm. Because there's the question of, you're pointing to two different structures, and we're pointing to a process within a particular structure. Oh, so yeah. we're actually asking about the process of peer review. Well, then I, I think what's up for grabs is the blind, is the blind part of it, right? Yeah, different structures create precisely the problem, but I think, mm. so I see your point. Mm -hmm. But is it, I mean, is it the, the notion of blind review that's at the center of this, right? Because my experience with peer review is that I have not, I've never written anything that I wouldn't say to an author, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That, that my criticism has always been, like when they ask you, here's, here's a separate place for your comments to the editor, here's the place for your comments to the author, I just cut and paste, it's the same thing. So I feel as though that if I undertake a review, I really want to help the author you know, sort of figure out how to improve that essay. So the blind part really doesn't seem to, to, to impact that or to impact my, my decision making. What I do think is that it does make a difference to me as an author to know that the person who had a lot of trouble with the politics of this argument is a historian, mm -hmm. right? Or the person who had a great deal of trouble with my um, with my data over here is you know uh, an empiricist, mm -hmm. right? Or who comes out of a quantitative tradition? Those things help me think about my audience and how I want to revise that article in ways that a blind review process, especially for interdisciplinary work, I think, um, doesn't help. 
And I don't think I don't think blinding makes it that much more objective. I don't know. You know, I don't know that we have data or research that actually demonstrates that that the blindness of the review or how that affects the the content or the decision. Yeah, and I would also agree with you that I don't think any model is going to be universally applicable yeah. in all contexts yeah. for sure. I mean, I know I just know that coming even from Canada where um, there is uh, public funding of uh, journals that I might my accountability is also different and also yeah. sort of the prices and rates we charge uh, so is the system of volunteerism that underscores underlies it it's it's very different and so I think that again to think that any one system can be then just transported into another context from my point of view as a feminist is is you know just wrong and I keep thinking about Shayla Sandoval's article um, on the differential consciousness as a way of thinking about uh, strategy mm. and not a singular strategy for anything, but um, different kinds of strategies that have to be adopted to deal with local conditions and to allow those to uh, exist um, as, as, for me, a, a kind of guiding principle in a certain kind of way for dealing with um, the very difficult questions of yeah. you know, thinking about what is, what is it that we want and what's appropriate where and how, for whom, and when. Well, and what your question, what's great about your question for me is it makes me think about, um, you know, really being self-reflexive constantly about the model of peer review. So it may be that we learn things about the process as we go along, where because we aren't wedded to a single ideological model of peer review, we can say, well, that didn't work that well, right? Mm -hmm. Or we had this multimodal issue and the peer review just didn't seem to, you know, everyone agrees that the peer review didn't yield what it should have yielded. It gives us the opportunity to, to reflect back on those practices and then say, well, maybe we shouldn't do that. And I think that, you know, with, with conventional peer review, you're just stuck with that model. Mm -hmm. You don't have this kind of opportunity, the opportunity that we have now to, to experiment and take some risks and see what doesn't work or what works better. Chelsea. Yeah, well, I mean, you kind of have always contributed more answers, but I was just going to ask, I know that you've given your thought about your personal work, but also being affiliated with SEMPOT and the upcoming journal, and if you could just sort of maybe centralize answers to what you would see as part of the peer review, like how you would like to see that enacted, and what would be sort of some practical ways, because I mean, I know you've all, we've all been in conversations about that, so sort of talking about that. as much as you think that would be useful, we can also come back to it. Well, I think one of the things, and again, this goes back to the beta reading example that I've been thinking a lot about is something, I, I don't have a word for it yet, but pre-review, because mm -hmm. often if you're editing a journal, you will get pieces and you say, you know, this is not ready for publication, but damn, there's a great mm -hmm. idea at the heart of it, and I really want to see this author work to, you know, to bring that to fruition, and so, you know, again, with the beta reading, I'm thinking, well, what if we can establish some kind of community mm -hmm. for pre-review where we make an editorial decision that this isn't ready for publication in this journal, in this particular issue, but we think you, that you should work with people, um, and this is a person that we think it would be great for you to work with. Um, and you, you both mentioned the issue of labor, and I think that that's at the heart of what we're talking about, too. I feel like I volunteer my labor to a lot of things I don't really care about. Mm -hmm. um, and I do have a certain amount of latitude in deciding what kind of labor I'm going to do. I'm willing to do work on things like this because yes. I find it exciting and I find it meaningful mm -hmm. and I find it a way of pushing the field along, right? And of, of helping people, you know, put together really exciting research. And it doesn't have to be research that I agree with or that looks like my research, but that for me is really exciting and energizing and that's where this does become a kind of feminist praxis. Um, and, and so I like, I like that idea because it does seem more generous and generative than the old models. You don't decline them, you don't reject them. I mean, some people you do, mm -hmm. right? And you're going to have to make those hard decisions. But there are other people that you say, this is really great, but it's raw. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna help you digest it. Mm -hmm. Shalini. about narrowing down a variety of voices into uh, a, a dominant academic 
academic voice. Mm -hmm. And I think that the very subject that we're talking about today, which is uh, internet publication, raises another completely different um, uh, modification of the vocabulary of diction and need for clarity, which is the very exciting prospect of communicating to people all over the world. Uh, there are a lot of people who work in call centers who are very well educated and who may well want to read your work. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a group of people who are very aware of communication all over the world and would be interested in reading your work. But are you writing a kind of prose mm -hmm. which is going to speak to that person? That person speaks good English, you hear them every day, they would read your work. The other, so that it, it is an invitation to us to imagine uh, people who are interested in, in my case, in the media, who are all over the world, who have all different kinds of jobs because of the kinds of jobs that are available to them, but who regularly look on the internet for this kind of communication. I was at a film festival in Korea, and the woman who was showing me around was in arts management. This was about five years ago. And she had discovered <coughs> the uh, continuing education arts management courses from the University of Oregon School of Art and Architecture and told everybody in her graduate class about them. And they were following those with great interest because it spoke to exactly the kinds of structures that they wanted to study. Um, so I think that uh, it's a wonderful challenge, and it's, it is leveling. It is reducing the plurality of possible perspectives, but in another mission, uh, not just to be academic orientation, but to be this level of communicability that I think we should aim for. But my question deals with the puppet master behind all of this, who is the editor. Mm -hmm. If you have this peer review process, you're going to have to have somebody or some bodies there who will decide what is good prose. Or suppose you get six, in this multi-level peer review, you get six written reports and they all say six different things about mm -hmm. what to do with the article. So my question is, what role do you envision of the editor for this uh, feminist peer review? And so it's not totally a democracy. I do want to add on a comment to that, that yes. I owe every publication, a journal publication, or any other publication I have in the academia, to the fact that there's been an editor who has made the, made the effort to send them out to people who might give me feedback, yeah. and also wrote, written to me a letter saying, this is what that person says, but I don't think that quite addresses what you need to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think... I think I think I think that the, the term puppet master raises my hackles. First of all, right? I just I just want to get that out on the table. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's not you know you have to have an editor because the work needs to get done, and that's the bottom line. Unless you have someone in charge of it, it ain't going to get done. Even in feminist organizations, I think that what you need to be able to do is have checks and balances. So it's rare in my experience to get reviews that are that divergent. And if they are that divergent, it points to a real problem with the article itself, right? You probably shouldn't have sent it. If it was, if it was that sort of up for grabs, it may not have been ready for peer review. I think that the other thing that if we, we do have to have a central editor. I think that Karen and I have had these discussions about how labor is going to work because we've been trying to proceed along this democratic access and it's, nothing's getting done. Nobody's in charge of it. Um, yeah. I think what you have to have is, you know, 
is if I were editor, say, you know, for a three-year period, I always ask other people to weigh in. If I have any questions about my decision on a particular manuscript, let's say it's not my area of expertise, and I'm like, I'm, not, I'm just not sure about this. It doesn't move me, but maybe it'll move someone else. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have other people look at it before you make a decision about rejecting it. I think in terms of the straight-out rejections, you want someone else who's going to say, yeah, this sucks. Um, by the same token, I think, you know, if, if we have a pre-review process, that makes it a little different, right? Because you do have the option of saying to people, if you have some, you're not sure, but you think it might be a really good idea, you have the option of having other people work with that person, you know, to help them get to a point where they can resubmit it. Um, but I think, you know, we need feminist leadership. One thing that we need to make sure that we do is rotate that leadership, right? Because the problem with a lot of bricks and mortar journals is you have one person mm -hmm. who is editor for life. Look at cultural studies, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's been Larry Grossberg with a woman for how long now? <laughs> um, no, I'm serious. And as much as I love feminist media studies, I think it's a really, it's a missed opportunity when feminists aren't encouraging other people to take up those leadership positions. And so you have to have people who are willing to say, I will do this for three years, but then the baton needs to be passed, especially if it's interdisciplinary. Because, you know, how changing the leadership and changing the discipline changes everything and gives it new life. So, what do you think? I, I agree with Harold in that regard because I, I mean, not to point, not to pick on feminist media studies, <laughs> but because I love Lisa McLaughlin yeah, and Cindy too. Carter, they're pe great people. But the the energy that came from both of them in the first two years, I quickly had my <laughs> first major publication <laughs> yeah. through that because otherwise that would never have got published. Uh, <laughs> frankly, I mean, tons of re re reviews coming in, rewrote it three times, but. Um, you know, uh, but the point is people get tired. Mm -hmm. yep. And people become victims of their own habits. Yeah. yeah. And so I'd rather have a single editor, but have them rotate. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think there has to be someone else working under that guidance. And it's so difficult to know how to handle those production things or handing over what, what, who is what article when and things like that. I'm just wondering in this model how, and you pointed you to the answer to part of my question, how different the editor would be than in a so-called customary or traditional review process? I don't know if there's a single model out there because there is other, you know, as they've said, in some journals, it, your editor and your editor for life in the journal is that editor. And in other yeah. uh, instances, like with the CJC, the CSMC. you... Um, you leave after th you leave, you have three years to learn, and you have another three years to keep on if you like. Yeah. But then you must leave, and someone new must be found. And I think it's a, it's healthy, and you do burn out. So there's I think there are other models. It's the question as well. I think another thing that can be done is guest editorships, and I saw that as a really important part of my job when I was editors. Once I learned it, was thinking you know other people need cre the credential of saying I've guest edited a special issue on. Right. And um, and then you help them as editor know what that whole process is of working with authors, et cetera. And it was it was great. But also they could bring energy and ideas and take mm -hmm. responsibility and and participate uh, in the whole kind of publication process. And they have a vision. And they have a vision. And so you got to then have a, a, a you know a journal that ended up having a, a wide variety of kinds of things then being right. published under the rubric of communication because it wasn't just a single editorial vision. Mm -hmm. So I think there's many ways to address that question but maintain a sense of, oh, well, who's going to make sure this thing still comes out and gets done and it has a regular kind of time frame and I can expect it uh, a couple of times a year, et cetera, et cetera. Well, and if you want to do what Julia was talking about doing and you want to have a multimodal publication, Having those guest editorships is the only way to do that, right? So mm -hmm. I could ask my colleague, Gabriella, if you wanted to do a special issue on, on documentaries and bring that kind of expertise and, and that sort of multimodal skill that I don't have to the journal. So I think, I think that that's part of the answer, too, is, that, is having those guest editors means a constant infusion of ideas and creativity and, and challenges to the format, too. And, and there are, I mean, even the existing uh, uh, journals, it, it gets, it gets 
the individual edit editor takes charge of that process. And so who the editor is sometimes changes the process. Mm -hmm. But I think with, with, with what we're talking about, we're trying to kind of put the process in place with, uh, with all those checks and balances possibly so that it can be done. Because there are editors who do some of these things, mm -hmm. but they do it out of individual choice and because they believe in this kind of thing, not because they're, you know, the process requires them to. So. Or you have section editors, too, where people you acknowledge that some people are really into pop culture and feminism, and that's what they do. Others are into telecommunications, that's what they do. And so people maybe know that there's always the possibility of someone with a certain expertise who's going to be in charge of finding, really finding the right reviewers for your piece and to um, deal with it in a relatively timely fashion and to, you know, let you know as quickly as possible if you, they think it's something that is potentially potentially publishable within a, mm -hmm. yeah, within a reasonable time frame too. So there's, all, I mean, any ideas people have about structure, sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think that the people are never going to be totally happy because you're in a position where you're going to say no to people. Of course. And the best you can do is to try to make those decisions as transparent as possible and let people understand how the decisions are being made and who's making them. Um, and there's two of you, one here and one behind you. Um, so, oh, um, you kind of I'm interested in um, maybe hearing you all speak a little bit more about non-academic publishing in a feminist context because it's out there all the time. Um, feminist blogs are everywhere. Yep. And a lot of the academic articles that I've come across are actually links from bloggers, from um, you know people who are choosing to kind of be intellectual in a public sense. They're not in the academy, and they're not ever thinking about you know subverting um, academic publishing and peer review processes and things of that sort. But a lot of the marketing for um, academic publishing comes from people out there who are just interested in spreading the word about these ideas. So um, instead of privileging the academic publishing context, I'm interested in maybe shifting the conversation a little bit to how, especially given this uh, notion of reifying academic and non-academic divisions in traditional publishing, how can we, as in the academy, be more involved in the dialogue that's happening, especially in, um, in digital platforms, in feminist communities? And um, how can we share what we're doing and then also share in what other people are doing in their own feminist publishing, in their own feminist voices? So perhaps you can speak to that a little bit. There's a good bit of that work going on with Bitch. Yeah. Right? Um, and, and I think... You know, I think that all of us are aware of what's going on in the feminist blogosphere. I tend to mostly teach... Uh, media criticism that appears in the feminist blogosphere. In my courses, it's mm -hmm. open access. It's it's in a format mm -hmm. that my students are familiar with. It makes the same points I want to make. It's free. Um, but I think, I, I guess I want to push on, on the one contribution I think we can make, which is that many of us are paid to do research. And that research is inaccessible in a lot of ways to the people in the blogosphere and to non-academic feminists. And we need to find ways to communicate what we're doing in a way that's more accessible and that's more interesting in terms of connecting up with those communities. I feel like that's something I have control over, right, is to start figuring out ways to take that really amazing research that I know my colleagues are doing and, and find a way to make that connect up, you know, whether it's with, you know, the feminists who are blogging about games, um, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we've quite thought out the other half of it, except to say that one thing that we've talked a lot about is having special issues where it's not just academics we're publishing, right? Like maybe we invite some of the people from, you know, uh, from uh, socio sociological images, right? Or some, but they're academics too. But you know, we we invite people from Bitch um, to contribute to a piece on feminist publishing. Um, we invite other people that we know who are feminist bloggers to contribute, and, and so we form collaborations that way. But I think it's one of those moments of great opportunity. I, I also want to... Did you, no, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to just go up there. 
But <laughs> I also wanted to say that um, we're taking it beyond writing. There are uh, non-academic writers blogging everywhere, um, and there's stuff being put out. Uh, but even in terms of our when feminist research more so, and I'm sure there are others who are doing different kinds of um, uh, social uh, issues research, but when more so when feminist research, we get involved with the communities we, we are working with and researching. Mm -hmm. And a lot of uh, what academic publishing does is it takes our work away from the community and puts it in, uh, uh, positions the academia as the audience and then does a kind of a translation and um, this is very frustrating uh, for us as researchers, but m and it does some sort of injustice to the communities we work from. And for instance, the nonprofit groups that I work with, um, sometimes, I mean now, it took a long time for me to get accepted with them, to talk to them and work with them and write with them. Or, um, and, and that's what we do, we write with them and we're unable mm -hmm. all the time to, I mean, sometimes I do it. It's, that's the part of the gorilla part mm -hmm. that I was talking about. But I'm not encouraged to write with them. So if I get a, a single author book contract, I'm actually writing with them. So when I give the manuscript, I'm putting them as co-authors and testing to see if either the uh, book, uh, book manuscript reviewer or the ed uh, publishing editor is going to tell me to take out those names. And luckily for me, in both the, in both my first book and the one that's going to be coming out, they haven't yet asked me to do that. So, uh, but the point is it's not, it's still going to not get the um, heteroglossia of this whole thing. Um, it's still a compromise. It's still a, a kind of a, uh, what, what, what the, my, my co-writers might at some point think of as um, a co-optation. And so um, we also need to be able to do multiple writing. But can a single journal do it? We, we need to signal toward it. We need to be doing multiple writing as in perhaps also having uh, writing that actually addresses policymakers mm -hmm. um, from a particular uh, location. Maybe invite the nonprofit worker to work because nonprofit workers don't have time to sit down and write. This is my role, and this is what I can contribute. It takes a while to say, okay, this part of this work that I did with you guys, this research, I feel like I might get a lot of um, um, merit credits, which is hardly any money these days, <laughs> you know, annual reviews, or I might get one more tag in my Vita that says my name if I actually translate it into academic publication. And after a while, it's kind of a high. I'm sorry about that. Um, but, <laughs> but, but, but then you have to make a decision at some point and say, that's data that's better served if I put it in a different format that would actually be for them. And if they don't let me, if they say I don't, they don't want me to put it out, I won't put it out. So there are decisions that you kind of have to make if you're, if you're as a feminist about what you publish and how you publish it. And if we're talking about a feminist publication trying to incorporate these kinds of multiplicities, then it is a structural issue that we are going to be taking seriously and negotiating, right? And we'll probably figure out ways in which those things are done and as a group, yeah. And Julia suggested so. Simpsons. Simpsons. Or the Simpsons. What? Or the Simpsons. Or the Simpsons. Yeah. All right. They believe everything. But if it's in an academic press, and I particularly have the pleasure of putting up that very long version I wrote before they said you have to reduce it by <laughs> one third. So on my website, I have the extra third in there. But you can do that. You, for years, people have been able to do this. And for years, I've 
tried to encourage everybody I know in academia to do it. This. And they either say it's too difficult or they say I already signed away copyright and they stop. You don't have to stop. And Frank Rich does it, uh, yeah. the sociologist Howard Becker, who you might know, does it. Yeah. Very too few academics do it. Mm -hmm. You can do it tomorrow. You can go over to the technology center with your uh, Microsoft Word documents and they'll have a little pretty template and put them all in with you for headlines and it'll take about a week. I think you should ascribe to academia.edu as well. <laughs> everybody should be doing it. Everybody yep. in the university yep. should be doing it. Yep. It's well, what free speech is. Well, it goes back to something that Kim said that I think we forget about is that my research is funded by the public. Right? I mean, maybe not the University of Oregon, since we only get 5.6% of our, our budget from the state. But at other institutions, this is work I did funded by the state. I mean, why shouldn't it be publicly available to people? Mm -hmm. But then, th that's one part of it. But the other part of it is figuring out how to do what you said earlier. How do we take the work that we're doing and translate it into a format that's going to be more interesting, more lively, more creative, and more accessible? And that's going to take longer. I think you were trying to say something. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking, yeah. like, a lot of what I've been thinking about, I think, with conversations with and that is the ideas around thinking of your work and your career path or, or however you want to call it as this portfolio of different kinds of, of work you do. Mm -hmm. It may be, you know, you have, you have your academic publishing conventional stuff that you might do, and then you have um, more open kind of models creative models and um, you self-publish or you NDL play and, and things like that. And I think that it's not subscribing to one particular model or one particular approach. And um, I also wonder about like what's valued in each of your contexts and who values it and to what end. Um, mm -hmm. And so each kind of, you know, I like to think of my work as different projects and they provide different kinds of participation to me. Some of them are commercial. Some of them are very personal, meaningful, and, and motivational. Um, some are, you know, much more creative in some ways. And I'm encouraged by the idea, you know, you've been talking about the significance, you know, taking other kinds, other mm -hmm. forms of publication and working through this. We talked about earlier about doing, you know, podcasts as a different, a valued kind of, of publication, um, things like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if it's, you know, this whole research about what is our production. How do we disseminate it? What are these different channels for distribution? And what brings value um, to each of these projects? I have a, a friend who came to the San Francisco Trail last night. I'm, I'm new to that Spanish university mm -hmm. from public sources because it, it's presented to us that all that the very little of the money is coming from the public, but that's if you count as being valuable, the money that goes into building those enormous structures to sports facilities, <laughs> and all of the money that's funneled in by corporations into very specific purposes that aren't helping fund uh, research and, and teaching and so forth. So I think that I'd like to revise that, that remark and say that actually a lot of But the money from Phil Knight, the money from private donors, that's not that's not money that's allocated to you owe from the state. That's and money that's when raised. They, when they use what I what my understanding is is that when they say that that nine percent of the funding or less uh, is coming from state funding, that they're thinking that the whole pool of money, including all of the money that comes in to build the sports facility, that that's an extract out the amount of money that goes to building enormous facilities for sports, mm -hmm. that's a much larger piece of the pie. I don't know the exact numbers, but I do know that that's, a, that's all conflated. Yeah, I don't know how much of, the, of that is funded by the state, right? Whether how much of the new arena building is funded by the state. It's a good point, though, because so, I don't know what that... So, so our public obligation, our obligation to the public is... 
Well, it should be. <laughs> it was right at that transition from print course facts to electronic reserves and the publisher was so afraid of electronic reserves that they said you can't use your own work and he says well what do you mean I can't use my own work um, and I was like well I don't think it's this way <laughs> but there are instances where publishers even in the smallest circumstances have come after faculty and it has been quite surprising so I would advocate that people make as much of their research available as they can through things like institutional repositories and that when you sign a license yeah. with a publisher that you actually look at what you're signing and send an addendum and say no, you know, I'm not going to agree to publish on these terms. And that the support of the senior scholars needs yeah. to be that if you say I can't publish in any of these journals, then the senior scholars need to support those younger scholars and say that's okay, they're going to publish in this other venue and it's good, mm -hmm. and it's quality, mm -hmm. and we support that decision. Yeah. That's a, yeah, I'd like to just say here, here. Mm -hmm. And I'd also say that um, what's interesting is um, I do know that at my university that they are taking as conservative a position as they can and always threatening faculty that if they don't comply with copyright, that it is they will not support them. Basically, if you get prosecuted, your fault, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we don't have, uh, there's, you know, there, um, my institution is being run by people who are you know, <laughs> taking advice of careful lawyers who are doing constant risk assessments, yeah. Yeah. and they're being listened to. Yeah. And we are getting letters from our upper administration basically warning us constantly about copyright violation. And I think a really valuable workshop would be about how do you deal with that so you can make mm -hmm. sure you never lose your own work and that you can redistribute it and that the universities are, you know, this is what's so weird about my institution. On the one hand, they're opening up open access and supporting, you know, a university repository. On the other hand, they're sending people letters. So it's kind of, you know, it's just strange. <laughs> it's a strange time, but I think we have to take a kind of bold role mm -hmm. in uh, figuring out how we um, deal with that, but also uh, advocate and give people the right training so they're not fearful about what it all means. There's a template for an addendum that you can attach to any public public. Publici publishing agreement, and I've been doing that lately. I haven't had a single publisher who sent it back to me, and it allows you to t retain rights over a lot of your material. Mm -hmm. So we should circulate that. Sure. Bethany's going to do that. Yeah, um, and I was just going to share with you so <coughs> remember when I was um, first advising graduate students and I had a colleague who would always say well you don't want to do that until you get tenure or you don't want to do that until you're you know and in my beef with with him and with his students was that inaction became a way of life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I think that it spoke to a, the people who didn't who weren't doing that work and weren't pushing the envelope as junior faculty members and taking those risks that became the way that they proceeded throughout their career. 
How, having said that, I think there are ways to cover your ass mm -hmm. and to make sure that you are getting your pieces in the kinds of venues that are going to be recognizable still in your field. Mm -hmm. That you don't have to sacrifice that to do the other work, right? So Bryce has an article that's coming out in one of the flagship journals of communica in communication, right? So his butt's covered that way disciplinarily. Um, which then frees him to do and to pursue these other creative projects. Mm -hmm. So I don't think, I mean, would you guys agree that it's not really an either I or? It's not an either or. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just like the uh, response we were talking about, multiple writing. We don't write just one thing, right? We write in multiple formats. Um, and this, is, this goes back to even the issue of we, we think what labor is, we think what feminist time is, we think what we want to do. And... Um, it's not an either or proposition by any means, but also know that if you are writing a feminist project still um, that deals with multiple things and you wanted to write it as well as you want to, some of these publications may not take them on. So yeah. even for your very own survival, you might want to rethink about multiple mm -hmm. publications. And often this whole thing of... Uh, you must publish in the top tier journals becomes such an oppression that you don't even publish anywhere. <laughs> yeah. I've seen that. I mean, yeah. I've seen some students who get terrified or, junior, or pre tenure faculty who get terrified. And they come to their third year review, third year review time, and they don't have a single one because they've been only sending it to the top tier journals. Right. And I'm like, nobody's reading yours in the top tier journal. And if you had had something somewhere, you might have got through third year review. Right? So, yet yeah, that advice that you have to only publish in top tier journals is wrong for your survival's <laughs> sake. <laughs> Not because we're telling you to resist it. But other than that, I agree with what Carol said. Okay, I have something to that, which is you asked a question. Could you put that in the university? Because um, you're either in or around or papers for chapters of your dissertation, which you can take to one of your faculty members and say, how often am I turning this into a good article? And if you're actually willing to listen to, <laughs> oh, maybe the third that'll be the article and the other's going to go somewhere else, but if, you, if you're actually listening in, in terms of being willing to say, well, this is a different kind of thing But I think you're also, if, you know, you're you're living in this really exciting period of time where you need to find mentors who are help you, who are going to help you make a case for yes. publications that may appear to be off the beaten track. Because you know there are people who are doing really interesting things with bibliometrics, right? Mm -hmm. There are people who are doing really interesting things with Google Scholar and citation indices in the humanities. It can help you make a case. I mean, when we were first. Um, coming up through the ranks, it wasn't clear that something like Camera Obscura was really a great publication yeah, to, right. to have your work appear in, Absolutely. right? And so we were in a position where we had to rely on more senior feminist scholars to say, come on guys, you know, this is a great journal, look at who it's publishing. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are also those places. I also think when it comes to publishing books that, you know, university presses still for my money, are, are the best bet. I mean, they have more prestige than the private presses, and you don't have to worry about the politics of, of Informa. Um, yeah. But I think there's a lot of interrelated questions there about thinking about your CV. 
mm -hmm. um, thinking about um, you know where you want to position yourself even in your own discipline uh, and I don't think those things are there's not even an easy formula or template and also the academic world is changing I'm, a, I'm shocked in a pleasant way uh, yeah. I think about how many positions are opening up for people with production skills for example yeah. which clearly means yeah. that there's a some kind of acknowledgement in, in um, you know, universities that they also want different kinds of or they're opening up different kinds of PhDs too or room for different kinds of hiring so so yeah so again I, I mean I'm I'm always also um, to echo something Carol said is that um, I've always found taking risks has been an incredibly actually rewarding thing and sometimes in ways that um, were unexpected that um, uh, I was surprised with the kind of support for the kind of work and research I did and sometimes also felt that if they didn't want to support that kind of work or couldn't read my CV in that way, I didn't want to work there either. Um, and I don't, can't, yeah, so, so there's lots of things to think about, but it's a whole series, I think, of important questions. It's the choice of labor. <laughs> we do have certain <laughs> choices still. Mm -hmm. It seems like you guys are now doing your PhD. <laughs> well, I, you know, from the research that I've read in the field, it seems like the most resistance to change is at the departmental level. Mm. You know, that really departments <laughs> aren't doing as good a job as they could at persuading mm. senior administrators. Because what do senior, senior administrators deal with people from all over the place? They rely on departments mm. to determine mm. what constitutes a really good tenure case in, say, ro romance languages. And so really, I think the obstacle is persuading the colleagues in your department that what you're doing is being published in legitimate areas, that it's being read by a lot of people. And that's the fight that we have ahead of us. And unfortunately, it's going to be you guys who are coming up through the ranks who are going to be the test cases for this. Yeah, or fortunately, right? But you know that there are people, there are people in, 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 you know, in your field who may not be in your department who can mentor and lend support too. And I think identifying those mentoring networks is really key. Sure. Is that it? I guess I have a question to you. What would you like to see happen? I mean, we have ideas, but uh, you might have ideas about uh, young things people. you think should happen that you would like to see incorporated into, you know, again, we're, I, I sometimes ready. find myself confused. <laughs> are we talking about a journal called Ada? Or are we talking also about a platform that's larger that can, for example, have the kinds of links to all kinds of things right. Uh, right. on that it you were talking about. that you yeah. were talking about earlier? So. That's a challenge. That a yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess what's so hard about that question for me is something I learned as a, a political organizer, and that's the moment you say invite them in, the game is over. Yeah. And so I really worry about how you create a structure that fundamentally includes women of color 
as stakeholders in the process itself and in the outcomes? say that um, even using, instead of using specific terms already existing as in the categories, as in feminists of color or feminists of, um, or transnational feminists, if we actually look at con our activists versus, uh, or non-academic non versus academic feminists, we actually focus on topics that are current topics that are struggles mm -hmm. um, and, and say, and, and also try not to intimidate through tone, perhaps implicitly we are inviting a discussion. Because if it's a topic right. and if it's out there on the internet as a topic that invites discussion, it may come from Mars mm -hmm. as a response, uh, hypothetically. <laughs> but again, you know, so that's the, that is a challenge again, yeah. Well, and I think it comes down to the construction of issues in the editorial board, mm -hmm. too, right, and how those things get hashed out. So if the first issue is a kind of mapping the field, then centering that question is a question and an issue is, is one way to start having a conversation at the very beginning. Having issues that are devoted to questions of race, class, mm -hmm. ability, in the field, Age. right? Totally. <coughs> I mean, because you can't, if you're going to have an edit, editor, right, you can't ask the editor, her or himself, to embody that diversity, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's, that's a sort of impossible call. But you can figure out ways that the journal's focus mm -hmm. performs that in, in constantly, right? That it doesn't, it isn't allowed, we aren't allowed to forget that as issues are put together. I guess that's what I want to say. I'm mm -hmm. aware even of how I continue to struggle to articulate these things. Mm -hmm. Even as I'm talking to you right now, I, I think to myself, I'm saying this wrong, this is more complicated than that. Yeah. And because, and I know that part of why that is, is because we need to talk about these things more. Mm -hmm. They need to be fundamental to all of our learning Mm -hmm. and, and part of it is also, uh, uh, to use a word, vernacular. <laughs> and what vernaculars are we including? If, and, and so, um, so you know, that's going to be difficult even in the reviewing process. Yeah. <laughs> you know, who do yeah. we find who can review a particular kind of vernacular expression? But it's also the very topic area, don't you think? Because the whole kind of ideology of the digital divide has made it seem like women of color are on the non-producing side or the, yes. the, the, the side that doesn't have access, where when I look at Gabriella's work, true. when I look at what Leslie's doing with the mm -hmm. one laptop, one child in Ghana, it's like that's, that, I mean, that's true. part of what really needs to be challenged. Yes, and, absolutely. and it's easy to, you know, to, to not center that in discussions about gender and technology. I know in Canada, for example, the discourse about First Nation people is much more robust mm -hmm. than it is in the United States. It's very important. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, I mean, in that a special issue that came from that particular context, I think would be really, really important to the future of the journal mm -hmm. and a way for scholars in the US who are working on native issues to kind of think differently about one thing I noticed is that by going, also actively going out and sort of saying to people whose work you admire, you think is being forgotten, overlooked, mm -hmm. and needs, uh, needs to be out there because we need to hear it, not because they need inclusion, but we need yeah. to hear it, yeah. um, is a really important. But what uh, there's a kind of reverberation that happens after is, you know, say with the CJC, once I, we started doing that work and, and also you know, giving it, giving those kinds of works peer review and also making them open access immediately, yeah. especially when they were dealing with things like the missing and murdered that women one. piece. Yeah. Right away saying, this is such a, so important, this trial is happening right. now, let's do it. 
um, then we we didn't have to then keep working <laughs> at invitation. Yeah. We were told what we should be looking at and publishing, and then you figure out ways of making that happen. Will because you tell people about that piece? Because I think it's really important, and not everyone's going to know about that, about the article you're talking about. Um, <coughs> yeah, Yasmin Jelani, who's one of my colleagues, and um, well, Marilyn Young from uh, 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 Victoria, I think, published at the same time they were following the case of Robert Picton, who's murdered a lot of sex workers in uh, mostly in the Vancouver area. And of course, it's still an ongoing issue and debate in Canada because we really feel like the police did not care and didn't do their job and had him on the radar. And it was, so it's being discussed, but they did a, an article that really followed the media discourse on, and uh, it actually did an immediate analysis as it was kind of going on in a way of the trial and its coverage. And um, they wanted to get it out. And again, as a peer, as an editor, mm -hmm. I could say, you know, I heard it at a conference or knew that this work was happening. So you go out and you say, can you, we need yeah. to have this now. We've yep. got an issue coming up. And um, can I also know that you know, we worked with the idea of expediting some pieces that we just thought were really critically important. Mm -hmm. um, and then making sure that, um, not that they just went to peer review in a kind of uh, tokenistic way, but they would get as quick, a feedback quickly as, as quickly as possible. But then also made it open source right away. So we had a rolling uh, access policy, even though it's quite, it's $25 to subscribe online if you're a student to the CJC. It's very inexpensive, not wow. like the other ones. But um, it just meant that it could, it could be out there in the public domain immediately. And it was picked up a lot by the, by the media as a result. So I think there are also strategies for publication and for making sure people who you know, but having your ear to the ground, going to conferences, yeah. keeping your eye out for work that's fantastic, having people who are like yeah. out there kind of going, wow, do you, have you heard about this person and this work that's happening? And just keeping your, your, keeping your ears open to what is important both politically and socially and finding out and encouraging that work mm -hmm. um, to take place is I think it, that's where as a, now a senior, which sounds weird to me, <laughs> senior scholar uh, with some, some experience, not much more, um, you know, we can do. So I think it's really how do we, how do we just, you know, how do we make that happen? Yeah, how to facilitate it. How do we facilitate it? It's happening. Midwife. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. And, and also I think for facilitating without um, um, tokenism, or also, uh, or burdening the yeah. very women of uh, color yeah. that you refer to as, as you need to contribute because we want to hear your voices. Mm -hmm. So there's a balance between those. And kinds we want to look good. We want to yeah. look inclusive. Well, it's yeah. the whole Audrey Morse thing. It's like we need to be educating everyone on racism and not to turn to I just wanted to say I don't think I thanked everyone adequately when I started to talk because I was so anxious to get my slide out. So I wanted to thank everybody. Thank you <laughs> yeah, for coming. Thank I know there so were a lot of events competing for attention today. So thank you.